Okay. Everyone, so we're going to continue with part two of what we started last week on the on the divine liturgy, um, going through it, and, and um, to remind you, my goal for for this discussion is not to be too academic, not to be too theological, not to be too historical about the divine liturgy, but offering ways that you can reflect on the service as as you experience it um, when you're here in church to keep you from being distracted, keeping you from getting very little from it. I know it can get to be a routine that we, we go through. Um, so it's just an offering insight. It's in no ways trying to retrain you on what you've already get out of it. If you get something good out of it, the way you, you attend liturgy already, I'm not trying to change that. I'm offering you some insights and offering you some, some historical experience of how the church has always done liturgy. Believe it or not, we're not the first people to go through liturgy. It's been going for 2,000 years. So just offering you some of the, what the saints would, would have thought of when they were in liturgy, okay? Um, one other resource before we start again uh, that, I, that I'll, I'll be referring to uh, is the, um, these are meditations on the divine liturgy. Um, I offered a, another book, this one, Praying the Liturgy, last week. But this is by Nikolai Golzhel. He's the, he's the historic Russian uh, fiction writer. Um, I guess Ukrainian, I guess you could, it depends on who you ask, who he was. Uh, but he wrote a, a, a meditation on divine liturgy, and he goes word, or line by line to the whole liturgy with these deep reflections. And he's not a clergyman, he was, he was a fic, he was a, he's, a, he's a classics writer. So um, I highly recommend it. You can, this is a very old copy, um, but they, now they have it in these bound books. You can buy them with added <laughs> notes and annotations and everything from uh, Holy Trinity. Uh, this, um, monastery okay so we left off last week at the coming in for the um, at the the great entrance in the cherubim uh, where we recall that the cherubim as that procession is we were we're saying that we're to be mystically be representative of angels like at that moment we become angels. And so we minister to the Lord as angels at that time. So we, we take on this transformation at this time, really. Not only are the angels present with us, that we and ourselves are putting away all earthly care. This is what separates us from the angels, right? Angels don't have bodies. So they don't really have a care for earthly things because they don't have a physical presence. We put away all that at this point at the great entrance so we can become like the angels mystically and represent and serve the Lord as angels, okay? That's where we left off. And then from this point, this is like the ending, uh, right before this is the ending of the what we would call um, formally the liturgy of the catechumens. I mentioned this, this is because this is where the faithful and the catechumens could both be in church historically for this, although half portion of the, the liturgy. And then at that point, historically, catechumens would leave because they were not full members and only full members would be able to partake in what was coming next, which is the actual Eucharistic, the, uh, the Thanksgiving service, the, the sacrifice of the, uh, of the um, bread and the wine um, and to partake in that, okay? So what we would be entering in now is what we would call the, the liturgy of the faithful because historically only the faithful would be present in the church at that time, okay? So coming in from the... Um, the great entrance, the uh, priest has now commemorated, he's commemorated the, the, the church leaders, he's commemorated, uh, and we talked about the differences in some church traditions on who gets commemorated at what times. He comes in and he brings and he now sets the gifts, the wine and the bread that was prepared before liturgy started by him onto the altar where the sacrifice will take place on the prestol, the altar, the holy altar, the table, okay? And the, from here on out, we're going to now have to call, the, the priest says, let us, um, let us attend, let us stand and write, let us worship, or offer the holy oblation, the holy offering. And so when we say stand and write, it means we stand like proper Christians who are in the presence of God. If God was to stand in front of us, this is how it is, that we need to stand well. Sometimes they say stand well, so we need to stand and write. It just doesn't necessarily mean to get up out of your chair. It means we are standing before the presence of the Lord, and that is in the manner that we need to stand at that point. Stand well, okay? 
And then from here, we go into the creed, right? the, the recitation of the creed. The creed is one of uh, three spots that where even if you're not singing in a choir, where the congregation should participate fully in singing the creed. Okay, we, uh, the priest says, let us with one mind, with, with one heart, profess, confess, and we all confess the creed. And we do that before we offer the sacrifice because we, in the Orthodox Church, you cannot take communion unless you believe the same exact thing. Some people will say, why don't you have open communion with other faiths? Well, because we don't believe the same thing. We don't believe the same thing. Well, Roman Catholics were so very close to them but we don't believe the same thing. We offer the creed exactly how it was written in the, in the ecumenical councils without any change. And we all have to profess that it is our belief. And so we should all, on a daily basis, be saying this in our prayers. And we should all know what every article, there's 12 articles. I think we've, I've, I've done a class on this already. There's 12 articles. We should all know what they mean. And we should all fully be able to engage in it. So we should all sing it. We do the same melody. Some churches, like Greek church, they don't sing it, they, they recite it, they, they just say it. Um, but we sing it, and we sing in the same melody. It's a very simple melody. We should all be singing it together. Um, uh, we had a deacon here not too long ago uh, as, a, as a gift to our church. He stopped by, and he directed, right? So in Russian churches, they direct the people to sing it. And he turned around and he directed the people because we expect the people to sing it. So sing it. If you don't know it by heart, learn it. And we should all sing it together, okay? All right? It's one part of the liturgy without, but everyone should participate in it physically with singing, okay? Just don't worry about what it sounds like. Just say it. Just say it, okay? It doesn't matter what it sounds like. All right, so as we, after we do the, uh, the creed, then we start, um, before we did the creed, I got ahead of myself. We said the doors, the doors. I want to comment on this. The doors, the doors, okay? Historically, the doors, the doors. What does that mean? That meant that the doors in the back of the church and historically were locked. The, the catechumens have left. Only the faithful remain. They are locked in. This is a sacred mystery. No one's getting into the doors without, unless you're a faithful member. And no one's going to see this mystery unless you profess that creed and that you are a baptized member of the church. That's historically how it was, okay? And so when we hear that, we also have to know that we're not only locking the doors from the outside, but we're opening the doors of our hearts. If we're opening the doors to Christ, we're gonna receive Christ. We're here to prepare for the Eucharist, for the, for the actual body and blood of Christ. So we have to, when we hear doors, I want you guys to say, okay, Lord, open these doors to my, to my heart and heart. Okay, think about that. And, and be prepared to soften your heart for the coming of Jesus, because that's what's coming, okay? That's what's coming right now in the liturgy. The, um, the priest says, he asks us to lift up our hearts to the Lord. So we have to open the doors, lift up our hearts. This is the best offering that we can give to God is our hearts, right? It's the best offering that we can give. He's given everything else. We can give our hearts to him. And then we go into, uh, the priest will go through this, the prayers these, these of the anaphora, of the offering, that uh, oftentimes you will not hear it. Um, they're done in an undertone. We, we sing them softly as the choir sings. But the first song is the singing of the triumphal hymn. was, Holy, 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 Lord of Sabbath, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Hosanna in the highest. Where do we hear that? Usually in the context of our liturgical cycle in the year. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Hosanna in the highest. Who screamed that and when? But Sunday. Sunday, Palm Sunday, the entrance of our Lord into Jerusalem. Okay? So from this point, we relive, in a sense, Christ's Passion Week, Holy Week. We're screaming at that time, like the little children, Hosanna in the highest. We're entering the Lord into Jerusalem to be sacrificed. And that's what's going on. So when we sing Hosanna the highest, that is what, think about Palm Sunday. Think about the entrance of the Lord into Jerusalem. That's what it represents. He's now coming, and he's been put on that altar for a sacrifice, okay? And so that's what's going on again. Every, so we're going to relive Passion Week in every liturgy, every liturgy. So it starts with the great, one of my favorite feasts of the year, 
is the entrance of the Lord in Jerusalem when we all accept him as king. All of us scream like as little baby children, Hosanna highest. He's the one who saves us. Okay? And he's coming into the altar to be sacrificed. So remember that when we hear that. When we sing Hosanna in the highest, the Lord is Sabaoth. Um, at this point, the priest will continue with the anaphora prayers, uh, um, which recapitulates, uh, relives out not only the Last Supper, but also the Christ's crucifixion and his resurrection, and ultimately Pentecost. This is what we all relive in this anaphora. So we say, take ye, this is my body. So as the priest says this, he is, uh, we're reliving out the mystical supper, the last supper, the holy supper that he had with his holy apostles, okay, be, before he, uh, on Holy Thursday, before he was going off to be judged. And the priest, unlike in the Roman Catholic Church, is not, we're pointing to the gifts and we're saying this as, because the Lord said it and we're reciting it as it was in scripture, but we are not changing by our intention that gift at that point. We're reliving out the Lord's Supper. That's all we're doing. And so we say, take ye, this is my body. The priest is just reliving out the experience of the Last Supper. So you gotta present yourself. When you hear this, think of yourselves in the, in the upper room, at the table, with the Lord, as an apostle. That's what's going on. Every time we serve the liturgy, it's the very same liturgy as Holy Thursday. Just as we said last week, we couldn't understand that even though liturgy is happening here at a certain time and place, but it's also happening in, in the kingdom of God at that very same time with us throughout the world and in heaven together in a different time and place that doesn't exist. That mystery is still happening now where we offer the liturgy. We are at the Last Supper. Same bread and wine, same body and blood will be commemorated and communed with. Okay, So you hear this Take eat. Remember, the Lord is offering it to you right there at the Last Supper. We were there. We were present. He gave it to us. He wanted this to be done as a memory to him, okay? And he does the same thing about uh, the wine. And then he says, Thine own of thine own we offer to thee uh, for, uh, on behalf of uh, everyone and all, right? So thine own of thine own. What does that mean? It's kind of strange language. But we're offering God what he already... But he already, it's already his. Like, we're giving him his already gift. Like, the, this liturgy that we're celebrating, it's an offering that's already taken place. It's a, it's a sacrifice that's already taken place, and we don't re-sacrifice God. We're not re sacrifice It's already done, but we're reliving now. And so he's already given us everything in the world. He's given us the way to make bread and wine. St. Nicholas Cabasilas, uh, uh, he did a commentary on it, but he says that man participates in the offering because God gives us the wheat, God gives us the grapes. And then we have this creative way of making wine, this creative way of making bread from this stuff. He's already offered it to us, and so we're offering back what he's already offered us. And so that he can give us something even greater back. So we're offering his gifts to him. Can you imagine giving a gift to someone and they give it back to you? That's what we're doing. And then they said, okay, here's an even better gift then. That's all we're doing. That's what the, the Thanksgiving is. Thank you, God. You gave me this stuff, we're gonna give it back to you. And he says, okay, I'll give you a better gift. It's amazing. Um, so at this point, this is where the real trans transformation happens of the gifts, okay? After this, the priest will say a, a prayer and then he will call down the Holy Spirit. we we'll call down the Holy Spirit upon the gifts that were sacrificed on the altar, our Lord, on the bread and the wine, and we ask it to be changed. We ask that the, the, the bread be changed to his body, and the priest asked that the wine will be changed to his blood, and we ask that this be done by the whole power of the Holy Spirit. This is what the priest is doing. The priest, not by his power, it's by the community, the royal priesthood, that we're all praying together for this great miracle to happen. The priest is just leading it, okay? It's the whole community having faith in this. He called down the Holy Spirit and he changes it. And at that moment, we have a personal, another Pentecost, okay? It, the liturgy was never offered until after Pentecost. You know this. The apostles never served liturgy until after the Feast of Pentecost, till 50 days, Till 50 days after the resurrection of our Lord. The Lord was there. He was offering bread. And that's how they recognized him in his risen state. 
But it wasn't until after Pentecost, the coming down of the Holy Spirit, that the, the apostles could do this. And so we do the same thing. We, we're not, it's not the priest. I know in the Roman Catholic, we think that the priest is changing these things. He has some kind of special power to change these gifts. I do not. I just stand before you as a representative of the community. Uh, and that's what the priest is. And so we offer these on your behalf. I'm the rep- your representative. You guys have ordained me. You guys have said axios, and I'm worthy to represent you. And so I stand before the altar, hopefully blameless, often not, uh, but, and we offer this sacrifice that's already been offered and sacrificed, and we call down the Holy Spirit to make the change. This is what's the difference between our Eastern and Western liturgy. So when you hear it, when this is happening, and you know it's happening, because you guys know, you can, maybe you don't hear all the words being said in the altar, but you know when it's happening. Understand that the Holy Spirit is coming down. And so I want to read from this book here, uh, on praying the liturgy about this very moment. It's a very special time. So um, a priest now calls the Spirit of God down upon the holy gifts. We call on thee, we pray thee, we make our prayer to thee. We send, uh, send down the Holy Spirit on us and these gifts placed here and make this bread to be the precious body of thy Christ and make that which is in this cup the precious blood of thy Christ, changing them by thy Holy Spirit so they may become for those who participate in them, the cleansing of soul, the remission of sins, communion with the Holy Spirit and the fullness of the kingdom of heaven. This is what the priest prays. So we are participating in the liturgy. And what he says here, those who don't are into the into Pentecost, those who don't even partake. Sadly, a lot of us, there's sometimes we're not going to take communion for whatever reason. You may have a good reason or not, even though that is the purpose of us being here. Maybe you're not prepared. Maybe it's not. So he, he gives us something to think about if that's, if that's the case. He says, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts before the coming upon the material elements of the bread and wine, which the objects are offering in the God's consecration. Do we feel the power and the importance of this inner and immaterial Pentecost? Do we realize that at this moment, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit have been given to us? Even those who are not going to receive communion sacramentally can, and if they turn to God with all their heart, still receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Certain barriers, certain things can stop us perhaps today from access to the sacrament. But the Holy Spirit breathes wherever he wants, and no frontier or limit can limit the love without limits. So for those of us who are not ready for communion, we are still going to be able to, if our hearts are open to it, receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is present among us. Holy Spirit's the one who changed it, but it's present still with us, okay? So it's, it's a, God even in his mercy allows us to partake of the communion in church faith as a faithful one, even when we're not ready or prepared or worthy of it because the Holy Spirit is there with us and we just have to be attuned to its presence with us at that time. So understand, it's a Pentecost. (laughs) Remember the events of Pentecost when we celebrated the the winds and the tongues of fire coming down. It's happening. It's happening invisibly before us at that time. Okay. So that marks the the highlight of the the part of the the anaphora. So we just went from the... It goes really quick. It's like a big crescendo. As soon as we go from the great entrance... And we offering our Lord on the table as a sacrifice from, we reenact the Last Supper. He is sacrificed on the altar. He is risen from the dead after we do this, and, and we have a Pentecost. So we, uh, the priest says these resurrection hymns, these, the troparians of the resurrection that we sing during Pascha. He sings, they're, sung, they're, they're read as we put him on the altar. So it's almost like we're entombing him in that altar, and he's going to come out again. He's going to be resurrected by the Holy Spirit for us to commune with. So think about that and meditate on that as we go to the liturgy. That's what's happening. I had uh, I don't know if you noticed, they had a couple altar servers sent out. Jacob among them. Ring his neck. It's because at that moment they were not serious about, they did, they're not in tune to what's going on, the, very, the, 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 the sacredness of what's going on. And I don't want any distractions at that time because of what's great, the greatness that's happening. And so they have to learn, we all have to learn to not be distracted at that moment. We have to fight hard all, all the, um, the logos moins that they say in Greek, the, 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 the thoughts, uh, 
uh, the, uh, we say uh, the Iskosinian Russian, the, the temptations that are afflicting us in our heads. At that moment, we have to fight. This is our duty. This is how, what you guys offer as a royal priesthood, okay? The priest is in there offering on your behalf and saying these prayers, and we're trying to be very careful that we don't have any thoughts come to our head at this time and that we're afflicted by <laughs> temptations of the devil because they want us to be distracted. It happens. They don't like this, what's going on. And so likewise, you too, you guys at this moment have to fight real hard during the liturgy to stay focused on what's happening because it's a great miracle. And if you get distracted, you're going to miss the majesty of what's going on. And that's what the little boys learn today. If they can't, it, it, at that moment, it's, it's, it's no excuse for being distracted or, or not paying attention. You have to be focused, okay? It's great to be, to be focused. It's a lot of work. It's, like a, it's, a, it's a lot of work, right? Especially when you're tired, maybe. Maybe your, your feet are hurting, your back hurts in this liturgy. But this is what we offer to God. We're offering him the sacrifice of our own, uh, you know, neglect, or neglecting our own comforts so that we can do this. And sometimes the liturgies are long, I know, especially towards the end. But we have to focus. Don't let your mind distracted on what you're doing after liturgy or what happened at work this week or what you got going on in the coming week. Let it all go. Be an angel and focus on what's going to happen right now, okay? And we can partake, even if we don't have the, uh, the preparation to take a, the body and blood. Know that the Holy Spirit is among you. And if you're a humble, contrite heart, you're going to experience that Holy Spirit within you. You can take that in, too, at this time. Okay? So, um, we can, from here we'll finish out a couple notes on how the liturgy finishes out. But at this point, any, any uh, comments or questions about the anaphora, the offering? The sacrifice. Yes, Julie. Um, so why don't we yell at Diana on the way now? Because I don't fancy opening. Uh-huh. And we always kneel. Mm-hmm. And I know um, when I go to the Greek church there, I kneel. And I know here that the Russians don't kneel. So why? What's the difference? Um, I mean, I know yeah. the Yeah. Yeah. So I, we talked about it a little bit last week. Um, you're actually, on Sunday, you're not supposed to kneel whatsoever. Um, you could, you know, if it was a weekday, you could. Uh, there's, there's prescribed times where you, uh, the, that you're supposed to prostrate at the liturgy, uh, primarily at, at, before the Lord's Prayer, uh, before we offer the anaphora, and then at that consecration after, not at thine own, but after, like, uh, after the, we say that this prayer, come down the Holy Spirit and make the change by the Holy Spirit, we would do a prostration before the gifts, uh, but there's actual canons in the church that we wouldn't, we don't do this on Sunday. That um, that Sunday is a day that we celebrate a, a resurrection, a Pascha, a mini Pascha, and just like Pascha, we don't kneel for that whole season. That we shouldn't do it on Sunday either. Why do they do that in some churches? Is because it's just local traditions of you know crept in. It's, I mean, no one's gonna. I don't think anyone here would come and take you out kicking and screaming if you did that but but it's just uh, but to be canonically tr- be, to be faithful to the canonical tradition you wouldn't do it right. but, um, it's okay it's a form of piety I know Romanians and Greeks everyone there's lots even in Russia there's communities that used to and this, it came, became popular in the Soviet uh, times um, because the only time they could have church was Sunday only time that church was open was Sunday that the Soviets would allow church and so people felt like oh, I never get to be on my knees or prostrate because it's Sunday and so it became very popular to still do this on Sunday and so you can find this in Russia that some in some locations they do this they still kneel on Sunday because of this um, again is it true to the canonical tradition no I don't think anyone if it's coming from a place of piety it's great but for thy known of thy known that one would be a weird place to deal um, because uh, you mean you would kneel for the re- remainder of the okay yeah yeah understood now okay make sense yeah yeah so uh, I usually say just do what everyone else is doing <laughs> so, <I> mean, <laughs> but <laughs> no no need to make a scene <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, again I think most of the time it happens out of piety not because they want to rip the tradition of the church away they just don't that's just what they've always done in a lot of churches but we don't do it here for the re- those reasons mm-hmm. and that's supposed to do it on sunday come on saturday you can do all you want mm-hmm.
for a little. So, all right. Anything else on for that service for the, that portion? Okay. So after this is uh, this consecration takes place, we do a lot of commemorations again for the hierarchs and and we're praying that the bishop for the bishops, um, and and then the priests will now pray for you guys uh, and that you would be able to receive the communion worthily. Uh, be, and that we know, in fact, before we close those doors at the end, before the priests take communion, we're asking that Jesus come invisibly and distribute the communion to you through our hands. So understand when you come and prepare yourself for communion, and I open those doors, and I bring out the chalice and say a prayer about this being the body and blood, that we've prayed that invisibly God, Jesus Christ himself, is giving you this communion. He's giving you this body and blood himself, just like he did the apostles. And so I'm just a tool, a middleman, just like confession. I'm just a tool, really. I'm nothing special. Jesus is doing it. Christ is doing it. I'm, his, I'm just his soldier. And so he's, when I'm giving you communion, it's Jesus, okay? And we say this. It's part of the, the prayers. So it's Jesus invisibly abiding with us and to give, make them worthy and to give them and to be in the presence to give you communion, okay? What you don't see is the priest uh, in the altar often because we close the doors. You only see this during Bright Week when we have the doors open. And, um, um, so the priest commune. Um, we take the body and, the, and we drink from the chalice and, and we say our prayers all at the altar. We, we, we take it at the altar. No different than you guys, only that it's not mixed yet. We take it individually, okay? And that's how it was in the early church too. Uh, we started mixing it several centuries in because it's easier to distribute and it's less messy. I don't know, the one thing we use, leavened bread, it, it can be crummy sometimes. And so if we know that it's the body of blood, we don't want any of that crumbs anywhere. So this is the easiest way to distribute it, quickest way without making a, a mess, without crumbs everywhere. So that, so how the clergy commune is how people commune early on in the church. That's just, that is a fact. Um, but it, so this did change how we commune with the spoon, uh, the chalice, all in one. And it became because we have a lot of people commuting. It's the easiest way to give it without dropping anything. And so it's safe. OK, if a priest to drop a crumb, we drop it on the antimincy and it's easy to clean and pick up. I'm not dropping the Lord on the body, his body on the floor uh, when I commune you guys. OK, so that's all the priests do uh, in the altar. We're just taking communion and then we prepare it to go all in the chalice. That's that's all we're doing in there. It's You're not missing a big show. We're just working for the most part. We take communion, then we do a little bit of work. Say a few prayers. Uh, at that time, we say the priest says prayers um, the, uh, for the resurrection, Sunday resurrection. The resurrection of Christ led us worth the only Lord Jesus, the only sinless one. We say this at Pascha on Sunday. We say it again because we're celebrating Pascha. We're celebrating a little mini resurrection on Sunday. So we pray these prayers, and then we take out the gifts to commune. Okay. When you come to communion, again, you're like angelic beings coming to commune with the Lord. You cross your arms, and I always tell the kids, we cross ourselves, and they have little angel wings. I always tell the kids, you got your, make sure you have your angel wings, okay? Uh, because we, we should have, although none of us are ever going to be worthy to take of the gifts, uh, but at that point, this is the point that we've, we're presenting ourselves to the best of our ability, prepared, um, and in the best state to receive God. And we receive his body and blood into us, okay? I don't think we even have to have get very meditative on this, reflecting this is truly what it is, okay? So, um, and the whole purpose of the whole Thanksgiving, the Eucharistic, that's what Thanksgiving means, we're offering thanks to God for all he's done, and we remember all he's done is coming into Jerusalem, being sacrificed on the cross, resurrection on the third day, and then, then the Pentecost, the hope, sending the Holy Spirit down upon us. We remember all that, and we take his body and blood. We get to do that, all that at liturgy. Right? Nothing big. No? So we should be doing it. We should prepare ourselves to do this. This is the whole part, the reason why we do liturgy. Um, the Lord says to do it often. Uh, in the early church, it was, you did it often. They did it daily. I know, get away from that as, as time changed, but we should prepare ourselves, okay? It's our duty as Christians to prepare ourselves for this. That's what sets us apart. If you're not doing it, why call yourself Christians? This is, what the God, this is what the Lord said that Christians do, okay? So we commune, and then from there we just say some, 
uh, the prayers of, again, thanksgiving for all those who are present, uh, the Anvon prayers, uh, and we'll bless those who love the church. And then we ask that we depart in peace. So when we leave the church doors, remember that we're supposed to be changed people. We are out in the world, and we deal with what the world throws at us. We come in, and we ask for all this, and we experience all this, and it's supposed to not keep us the same person. We're supposed to be different than when we, different person when we come in the doors, it changes us, and we take that out into the world. We take that peace that we've got from the church service, and we take it out into the world, okay? So when we depart in peace, we take all this that we've experienced, that, and we take it out. We're new people. Every time we participate in this, we're being transformed. We're being transformed into something that we're called to be. And we're getting closer to God. We're becoming more holy. We're becoming like the angels in body, like St. John of the Baptist. And then we go into the world and we proclaim that and we live it out. And then we probably are going to get filthy out there. We're going to get dirty and defiled. Then we come back and we try it again. We cleanse ourselves. We get our peace. And we become transformed again, and we take it out and give it to the world again. And it's just a cycle of this battle, but this is the spiritual life. If you're, not, if you're not fighting, you're losing. You understand? This is how the spiritual life is. If you don't take it out there and fight, you're losing. You have to fight. You cannot just be neutral. So take out what we do here. Take it all in. Get armored up. Get all the weapons and go out and fight. And then come back in and fill up again. This is, this is the spiritual life, okay? All right, so that, that's all I have to present for the, those two parts. So anything you guys want to talk about liturgy, any customs? It doesn't have to be about how to reflect, but anything. Uh, thank you for bringing your question. You know, I like to talk about differences in liturgy. Because um, it's, yeah, yeah, it's nice. Yeah, if you've only been to one church your whole life, you're missing out. Yeah, yeah, you're missing out. Mm. And we never even the doors when we did. Mm-hmm. So is that normal? Is it normal? Well, maybe for them it was normal. It's just different custom and tradition. So doors uh, are obviously, that's very traditional since about the 4th century. I think St. Basil the Great is the first right. recall of them. But yeah, there's a rubrics that typically calls for the wind to open and close the doors. Okay, And, and local tradition changes as time goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's okay. So there's a lot of them. Yeah. Or not when he was changing. There's just, that's just a local practice for a lot of people that they just do that, okay? Um, in our church, you would always serve with well, the doors closed to begin with, and we open them when there's a need to open them. That means they are going to come inside, and so we open them for that. Or if there's a reason I'm going out to give the communion, there's a reason those doors are there to use them. Um, in the Russian church, they have... Um, I don't know, us priests, we get these, like, like it's like a, we're like in the service, you know, they'll give us these promotions, these ranks, you know, <laughs> these, these titles, and, and sometimes in between these titles, they'll give us these little, okay, we'll let you wear this part of your insignia, you know, a little bit more to you, and so one of these big, uh, uh, like, rank promotions is that you can serve at the doors open at, uh, during the beginning of the liturgy. Um, when a bishop serves, it's always like this. The bishop's always open until they, until they commune. And so they'll give this in the Russian church as, a, as an award for a very senior uh, mitered priest. Yeah. yeah. So they'll, get, they'll have this award. Uh, in the Greek churches, tens, they just open them up and they serve um, in, in parochial practice. I think in Mount Athos, that's not the case. So I, in fact, I probably, they probably don't ever want to open the doors there. If I, <laughs> and they're very small. Right. Very short. They know what, they're very, they're, it's very symbolic in Greek practice, Athenite practice. The doors are very short and so, like this because the kingdom of God is narrow path. So um, it's just different practice. But if you follow the Tipicon, there's times when the doors and curtains are open. The cur- curtains are symbolic of the curtain in the Old Testament that was rent into, right? We say that was rent into when, on, at, at, at the uh, crucifixion of Christ. So we, there was a curtain. There's a curtain, and so that the, um, we have times when we open and close them as well. Uh, so I try to follow exactly what the book says and what, with it, with regard to that, um, at least in our Russian tradition. The Greek practices might be a little bit. You come from Carpathian Russian, but back then they might be. They're probably more influenced with the Greeks on that. 
Yeah. Because the first day I came here, I was like, I had one of these in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why, why is he doing this? Yeah. And then as I came here for almost a year now, I was like, oh, okay. You know, that's what's happening. Yeah. But then our previous church, uh, Father Pam was the first pastor. Uh-huh. So yeah, that might be a case. I don't. I, I'm not very familiar. But we never had a curtain. Never. Mm-hmm. Never had a curtain. Or maybe back when, before the church was, you know, the new one was built. But you, you see different things. I haven't even seen a Greek church. They just have a sliding door like this. So <laughs> it'd be kind of strange to close that in and out. I've been to one of those churches. They're local things, but on the whole, I think the way I serve is where you're going to find in most Russian parishes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, in Greek churches, they probably, in here in the States, they probably just open them up for the kingdom, bless the kingdom, and they keep them open until communion, I would suspect, in my experience. Yeah. So, just a little bit. We, I open them to do what I have to do, and I, then I close them. It's, yeah. So, some old priests, mm-hmm. like, like, if you go to the monastery you hear, there's a curtain, there's a door, mm-hmm. because they're behind it most of the time. Yeah. Um, the, the reason I've gotten is that the, it's the mystical part that you're not really supposed to see, just like the prayers you're not supposed to hear, mm-hmm. like kind of deal. So like, if there's no curtain, if everything's wide open, it kind of loses that. There's certain things that we don't, I guess, actively participate in in the liturgy, like that's for the priest to say, mm-hmm. see, and those in the altar. Mm-hmm. So it's like that's the rationale I. That's how I understand. Like, that we, we, yeah, there's lots of things we can rationalize. <laughs> I, I, um, and and, and so that, I mean, that's the beauty of symbolically looking at these things. We can make sense to them in our head and, and get some uh, through our pious understanding. But um, yeah, you know, we, we do kind of play in our liturgy of this concept of the kingdom of God opening and closing and opening up to us. And that's it's part of the doors and the, and the curtain. Uh, there is some part to that. Uh, I'm talking just... When I, I'm answering a question on a practical, I, if you look at the book, that's when it says to open it because you got an entrance coming. Yeah. Um, we can say, well, yes, that's we're not really separating people, but they're but we are trying to enter into that kingdom of heaven, and it's not an easy thing to do. And so we get glimpses into the heaven, just like in our life, right? Every now and then we get a glimpse into that peace of God in His in the heavens, but oftentimes it's close to us. And so it's the same thing in the liturgy. There's times that that opens up, and we can see the kingdom of God. That's the the what is it, crystal, the um, the holy table. That's what that is. It's the altar. That's the kingdom. So, yeah, I've heard that too, 100%. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think in the, you've been, you've been to plenty of um, Athenite monasteries that Ephraim, they have, they have the full thing too. Yeah, they're yeah. Most of the, yeah, yeah. They, yeah. They come out, they come out for the entrances and they go back yeah. in. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. In fact, our Russian practice and the Athenite practice is, Virtually identical with some minor things here and there. They, they serve the same way. They serve the same tipicon, that's why. Modern Greek churches have got a, a newer, updated tipicon from the 1800s. Yeah. But not, mo- of course, you know, you don't expect the Athenite monasteries to take that. So you'll see that this, this is very much identical, yeah. other than the flavor, the Greek, the Byzantine flavor differences. Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, we're almost to 10 o'clock now, but it seems like a long time to fast. Oh, sorry, third, sixth hour, I'm sorry. So sixth hour is 9 o'clock. So it's about three hour difference. So we've seen the third and the sixth hour, right? And so third hour is, uh, is about 6 a.m. Sixth hour is about 9 a.m. So canonically, 9 a.m. is when liturgy. But we know from historic, uh, from the reading the gospel or in the epistles, they, they had liturgies at night. They were doing liturgy at night with St. Paul. They were doing it in house churches. Um that's just that's how it was, and it wasn't until later that it was done in the morning. And the fasting, what they weren't fasting; they were having a big meal. Right? If you, it's it's big big contradiction. I know we fast before liturgy now out of piety, but in the early church, you can read the accounts. Saint Paul was celebrating with the big they call it a big love fest, a, a love meal, a meal of love, and they had a big meal. The Last Supper, believe it or not, was a big meal, and then he presented the right, and then they, he gave the body and blood. So. It, it's today, I don't know when that changed, but uh, canonically speaking, we're supposed to do liturgy at nine o'clock. It's the most canonical hour to serve liturgy because that's the sixth hour. So um, we do it at 10, that's fine, very custom. Um, but nine, nine, hour, nine o'clock. 
and the obviously our fasting regulations develop much later. Usually, most of our fasting regulations come from the mon monasteries, from probably the fourth and fifth century onward. In the early church, you weren't going to find that. No, they did fast um, Monday, fr Friday, or very early on, very early on in the church. You see that in the first century in the Didache. That don't fast like they said. Don't fast like the Jews on, who did it on um, uh, was it Tuesday and Thursday. Do it on Wednesday and Friday. Yeah. But yeah, the the, the the communion fast is not. It's in the canons, but it, it's a later development. Don't know exact when. Is that what you want to know exact date? I don't know. No, I was just, yeah. I was just curious, like, what time did they, what, what time did the church start? Well, it's supposed to, but canonically supposed to be 9 a.m., <laughs> but in the early church, they, they met all the time. Yeah. They commit, they kept the hours of the of the temple. The early apostles, they went to the temple at certain hours to pray. They kept the hours. So when we inherited that, we inherited the Jews these separate times to, to pray. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Any, any other comments, questions I can answer? Uh, is there anything that, like, like I just went through the whole liturgy, what about, like, when, when you change your vestments, like, hats on, hats off, mm -hmm. robes on, robes off, uh -huh. how does that, what's the significance of all so that during the service? Mm -hmm. for, for liturgy, I'm, all, I'm fully vested, except for, uh, at all times, except for the hat. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, the hat, uh, you, you notice that men aren't supposed to wear hats in church. They're not supposed to cover their heads. Uh, and priests, we, we, we wear these things because we're separated, just like it's part of our vestments, but we still take it off at certain parts. So when I take my hat off, it's, it's going to be for the reading of the gospel. And it's good, uh, so uh, out of reverence for the word that's being proclaimed. And it's going to be for the whole anaphora, that, that whole part we just went over after. So the great entrance, my hat's off. And all, for that whole time, out of respect for the for what we're doing, I, I don't wear a hat. And for communion and distribution, I wouldn't wear a hat. So that whole time, until I get to that last prayer before the dismissal, then then I could read that that after everyone's communed, then I could put a hat back on. Well, what about like on uh, vesper service? So vesper service. Um, it's by tradition. Um, usually, uh, in a Russian church, if the doors are open, we should have our what was called the falong. It's the outer garment. If the door, royal doors are closed for these other servers outside liturgy, then we could take it off. Uh, so just come with custom. I think in mainly Byzantine style churches, and even in Russia today, I've noticed they just put it on and they leave it on because sometimes it can be a hassle to take it on and off. But if you're in a long service, sometimes you don't want to wear it the whole time. <laughs> Just as a practical note, okay. yeah. So they're kind of, they're, they're, you know, they can be depending on what type of weather it is. It can get kind of hot. We wear a lot of, you know, I have my clothes under this, and then I wear this, and then I wear another uh, outfit over this. That's my for liturgy. So that's the, the uh, our uh, Padriznik, uh, our Stikarian. It's white, and then I put on those vestments over that. So I have four layers on. So. Summers are kind of rough sometimes. So, yeah. Um, did I, I could go. Um, I can I get with you on the on the vestment part. I know it's a little intriguing, but we've inherited a lot of our vestments, one from our our the Jewish priesthood, but also from the Byzantine imperial court. <laughs> so what we wear is very Byzantine imperial. Uh, to probably some Protestants were like, "Aha! I knew you know they they gotcha. You guys are you guys innovated." But yeah, I mean. A lot of what we wear, and if you look at bishops, they're wearing like what the imperial emperors were. Like when you see a bishop wearing, it's just it is what it is. That's that was the t the church was developing like crazy at that time, and so they inherited a lot of that dress, and we kind of stuck with it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Right. Okay. Well, let's end it. Let's pray.